as, as Jeremy uh, shared and as Nancy uh, shared, we, we have a vision as a church to make disciples, to uh, plant and strengthen churches, and to um, hopefully see this lead to transformed lives and communities. That's what God has put before us. And last week, I spoke broadly about our vision as a church. Today, I want to speak specifically about making disciples. And uh, Don uh, spoke about being an entry-level disciple. Whatever level of a disciple you are at, I, I trust that today our lives will be changed. I trust that today God is going to grab your heart in a new way. Uh, God is going to mobilize us for action uh, for this great work of making disciples. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to Matthew 28, and we'll be reading verses 16 to 20. Uh, the words of Jesus in this passage are powerful. Uh, these words are uh, commonly referred to as the Great Commission. We also have them up on the screen for ease of reference, but you know, it's great if you have your own Bible with you, you can go back home and, and read it and, and dive into it in your own time after this service. This is what the Word of God says. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. After his resurrection, Jesus told this group of women that was on their way to his tomb. He meets with them. Um, they had seen the empty tomb. And he meets with them and he, and he says to them, please go and tell my brothers, meaning the disciples, to go to Galilee where they will meet with him. Go tell my brothers. That communicates relationship, friendship, community. Go tell them that they should go to Galilee where I will meet them. This word disciple means a learner. A disciple is someone who is learning from someone else. And, and these 11 men, they were down to 11, they were originally 12, but Judas betrayed Jesus and then killed himself, so they're down to 11. These 11 men spent three years learning from Jesus. They spent three years following him. They were followers, and, and as they followed him, they became more committed, more devout. These were the disciples. This is the group of guys that is referred to in this passage. And it's, it's important for us to observe right from the beginning that Jesus made disciples in the context of relationship. These men were his brothers. In John 15, 15, he says, I, I, I don't call you servants anymore. I, I, I now call you friends. There was a relationship. And if we're talking about disciples, we can't get away from relationship. 
So the disciples do as they were told. They went to the mountain. And when they saw Jesus, what did they do? Well, it says they worshipped him. And that's the appropriate response. Jesus is to be worshipped. He's king. He's Lord. He's master. He's savior. He's the Messiah. The appropriate response is worship. But at the same time, some doubted. This was not the first time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. So perhaps the doubting had something to do with some of them still coming to terms with, is he really alive? Or perhaps the doubting is the way in which he appeared to them on this particular occasion. It goes on to say, then Jesus came to them, sensing this, this doubt, this what's going on. Jesus came to them. He, he drew near to them. Jesus is wonderful. He draws near to us. And as he drew near to them, Jesus referred to the authority that he has. Authority that was given to him. Authority that he received from the Father because Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He didn't come with his own agenda. He came to do what the Father sent him to do. And the extent of this authority is all. Jesus doesn't have a little authority or some authority. Jesus has all authority. All authority where? Because authority is exercised somewhere. It, it, there's got to be a sphere in which authority is exercised. Well, the extent of his authority is heaven and earth. It covers the universe. Colossians chapter 1 says that Jesus created all things in heaven and on earth, and that all things were created through him and for him. Everything exists for the authority of Jesus Christ. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And speaking out of this great authority, Jesus said that there were certain things that his disciples had to do. First, he tells them, go. Therefore, out of this authority that I have, go and make disciples of all nations. He gives his disciples a job to do. It was to go and make disciples of all nations, to go and make learners. Guys who are learning about Jesus, learning about him. Go and make followers. Help people to follow me and do this in all the nations. Now, nations here does not refer to the 195 countries that we have in the world today, although there is some overlap with that. Nations refers to groups of people, like a tribe. It refers to the non-Jewish groups of people, because these guys, these guys were all Jewish guys. And, 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 and Jesus is saying, guys, I'm calling you to go out to the, to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, to those nations, and make disciples. Question for us is, what are the groups of people around us that we can go to? Where is God telling us to go and make disciples? Jesus shows these disciples that what it means to be a disciple is to be someone who makes disciples. Jesus was saying, you disciples, go and make more disciples. A disciple is someone who makes disciples. 
as disciples of Jesus here, we should be making disciples of Jesus. And we do that by going. We start in Dar es Salaam, that's where we've started, but the mandate is very clear. The mandate is all nations. The mandate is the whole world. It is all the people of the earth. If you're in Tanzania and your reason for being here is to make disciples, and, and perhaps it's becoming more challenging to do that, I want to encourage you, and, and that's everyone's mandate, but perhaps your specific circumstances are such that it's becoming more challenging here. I just want to encourage you that you have the whole world. The whole world. All the nations of the earth. That's the core. So, man, if, if we feel we still need to be here, making disciples here, that's the conviction. Let's pray. Let's trust God. God opens doors that no man can shut. God moves mountains. But equally, we need to be open to the fact that, man, the calling, wow, it's to all nations, the whole earth. That's pretty amazing. There are a number of global movements that, that you know, their, their, their vision is the whole world. Certainly, that's the vision of the disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the whole world. Second thing that Jesus says, he says, you are to baptize these new disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what's Jesus saying? He's showing his disciples that baptism involves all three members of the Trinity. Christians, we believe that there is one God, and this one God is three persons. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and each of them is different from the other, and each of them is fully God. And, and Jesus is saying when, when baptism happens, it it's symbolizes a relationship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity are important for a Christian. Maybe some of us, we're, we're, we're more comfortable with the Father or with the Son or maybe with the Holy Spirit. And it's all three. The Christian life is, it's all three. In fact, when, when Jesus restates the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1, before he ascends into heaven, he actually says to the disciples, he says, you guys need to wait until you receive power from on high, until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So even this calling to make disciples is a calling of being empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's done in the power of the Spirit. Father is there, Son is there, Spirit is there. Jesus asked his relative John the Baptist to baptize him. And, and one of the reasons when we teach people about baptism, one of the reasons we say it's important to be baptized, we say, well, because Jesus was baptized. In fact, John was like, man, I should be baptized by you. And Jesus insists in Matthew chapter 3, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. So he was in the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. The baptism of Jesus Christ, the Father, 
is there very clearly. The Holy Spirit is there very clearly. When we get baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we're trusting, ah, the Father, we have a relationship with you. The Son, we have a relationship with you. The Spirit, we have a relationship with you. This word baptize, it means to to dip. It means to immerse. And there's, there's a number of passages in the Bible that help us to understand uh, baptism. One, one of those is, is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, where he tells the Romans that baptism symbolizes our union with Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection. So as we are dipped as we are immersed union with Christ in his death in his burial as we come out of that water union with Christ in his resurrection symbolizing this new life that he has given us some of us have not been baptized You are a disciple of Jesus Christ, but you have not been immersed in water. You've not been dipped in water. You you should get baptized. And then you should go and help others become followers of Christ who then also get baptized. Over the years, we have baptized quite a number of people. I've noticed that in the last year or two, the number of baptisms that we are experiencing at God's tribe has been, it's been decreasing. God's in control. I would love 2020 to be a year where we see more people getting baptized. If you would like to hear more about baptism, if you would like to get baptized, I'm going to ask you, where's Frashia? Still here. She's over there at the end of our service. Frashia, where will you be? Will you be there or will you you'll be over here? Please go to Frashia. Put your name down. We'd like to have a conversation with you about baptism. The third thing, he says that they were to teach the new disciples to obey everything that Jesus commanded and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The disciples were to pass on the commandments of Jesus to the other disciples. Jesus commanded many things. And he wanted those things that he commanded to be passed on to these other disciples. And he wanted the disciples to teach obedience to those commandments. He wanted them to teach the new disciples to keep, to observe, to do what those commandments said. So being a disciple requires that we know what Jesus said. We need to know the Bible. We need to know the Gospels. And by by, by Gospels, I'm referring to the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because in those first four books of the New Testament, Jesus is living. He's alive. He's, He's in the flesh. And he's walking the earth, and he's speaking things, and he's doing things, he's giving commandments. So if we want to get up close and personal with the commandments of Jesus, it's great to know the whole Bible, but certainly the the Gospels will really help us to know what Jesus said. Now being a disciple is not only about knowing what Jesus said, it is about doing what Jesus said. We used to be part of a church called 
hear the word. And I remember our senior pastor once saying, you know, sometimes I look at that name and I'm like, it's not just about hearing the word, it's about doing the word. They've actually changed the name of the church now. Probably not just for that reason, but that's probably one of the reasons. It's more than just hearing. It's actually doing. The life of a disciple is a life of learning obedience. Remember, a a disciple is a learner. What's he learning? Uh, What is she learning? She is learning obedience to what Jesus has commanded. And how does he or she learn this obedience? Well, he or she learns this obedience by being taught how to obey by another disciple. You and I as disciples of Jesus can teach other disciples to obey what he has commanded. Now, there's no single way of teaching obedience. There are some things that I would like to share with you, nevertheless, with regards to obedience to the commandments of Jesus found in the Bible. We can all be involved in teaching. It's not only the elders, the pastors who teach. As we go, you will reach places that some of us will never reach. You'll be able to teach people that we will never be able to teach. So, as disciples who make disciples, every one of us who is a disciple should be involved in teaching other disciples. Teach people to read the Bible well for themselves. Our primary source of learning to follow Christ is the Bible. So teach people to read the Bible well for themselves. To read the Bible well starts with a clear conviction that the Bible is the Word of God, that through the Bible, God actually speaks, that through the Bible, God is actually wanting to change our lives. To read the Bible well includes understanding what we are reading in context, in the context of the whole story of the Bible. One way of thinking of the story of the Bible is to think of it under three headings. Creation, God created a good world, very good when he saw it. Then the fall, we fell, sin entered the world, the world was corrupted and it has been corrupted ever since and we're living with the effects of that corruption now even in this room. So creation, fall, and then redemption. Because God, in His mercy and grace, He comes to redeem. And He redeems through Jesus Christ. And the work of redemption is continuing right now. And the work of redemption will continue until Christ returns for His glorious church. Creation, fall, redemption. That's one way of thinking about the whole story of the Bible. As we read the Bible as well, if you're in a particular book of the Bible, ask yourself, this book, how does it fit into that wider story? As we read the Bible and you're in a passage of the Bible, how does that particular passage fit into the whole book that you are reading? And that's why it's helpful as we read the Bible to read it in chunks, like, like read a whole passage. Now read a passage. Uh, it's, it's fine to read verses, but if you read a whole passage and dig into that, you get more because you're, you're getting more of the context. You're getting a bigger picture view of what's going on. To read the Bible well 
means making good observations about what we are reading. Who are the key characters? What are the main words? What are the main themes? What are the main events? The Bible is a historical book in addition to being other kinds of literature, if we could call it that. What are the main events? Where are those events happening? Observation. Oh, man, I'm, I'm picking up some things here. To read the Bible well also includes memorizing the Bible. Teach people to memorize the Word of God. Jesus memorized the Bible. When, when Jesus was, was being tempted by the devil before he started his ministry, what did he do? How did he respond? He responded by saying, it is written. He was making reference to his Bible at that time, the Old Testament, things that were written there. So memorize the Bible, learn what it says, make it part of yourself. To read the Bible well includes having a plan. What's, what's the plan that you have? Ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, how, how, how should I go about reading the Bible this year? Ask someone who's a, you know, a few steps ahead of you in, in, in the journey of, of faith. How, how would you help me to think of reading the Bible? Should I, should I be thinking of reading the whole Bible? Should I be thinking of reading through the Old Testament? Should I be thinking of reading a particular book, reading on a particular theme? I've been reading through the book of Job. This morning, we, we got here a bit early because um, our son Daniel, you know, with, with, with Matt Cripps, they're practicing quite early. So I went to my office there and, I, and we had had a conversation in the car about reading the Bible as a family. It was a bit tense at moments, challenging our kids about reading the Bible. And, and then I said, yeah, you know, guys, on Sundays, I sometimes, I often don't get into my personal Bible reading because I'm busy getting ready for church. But I, I realized, actually, I have a moment. So I went to my office and I, I dived into the book of Job. That's where I'm, I'm reading right now. And I've, I've been reading the book of Job mainly because I've been going through some, some challenges, some difficulties, particularly pertaining to my health. So I want to understand God's perspective on, on suffering more than I currently do. I have that plan currently. So what's your plan? To read the Bible well includes, and this is really important, applying it to our lives. We are not just after information. We want transformation. Teach people to practice what the Bible says. We believe God wants the Bible to change us. How am I supposed to respond to what I have read? What will I do to obey what I have read? When you read the words of Jesus, when he's talking about your marriage, how will you respond? When you read the words of Jesus, when he's talking about how you relate to needy people, how will you respond? When you read the words of Jesus in any area, it's not just good information. It's information that's meant to transform us, to change our lives so we live differently. And we need to be learning obedience, teaching obedience. And we follow up, hey, how's it going in that area of your life in terms of what Jesus has said? Encourage people to read the Bible on their own as well as in groups. Read the Bible, family, um, your, your life group. We have life groups. Uh, a life group is a, a smaller gathering of us that meets to grow together in our faith. And, and part of that is being in God's Word together. And we'll hear more about life groups at some point during this month. Encourage every one of us to be part of a God's tribe life group if this is your church. Our faith is lived out individually as well as in community. 
Maybe you're in a group of guys. Maybe you're a group of ladies. Read the Bible in community, but read it individually as well. Jesus taught his disciples together, but he also had moments like with Peter. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Well, feed my sheep. Very personal, very individual moment there. But also, Jesus rebukes Peter. He says, get ye behind me, Satan, when he's with his buddies. <laughs> so it's like it's individual, yes, but man, we don't take away the element of community. You cannot grow as a Christian, as a solo Christian. It doesn't happen. That, that actually is, it's, it's, you can't define a Christian as someone who's trying to live as a Christian on their own. That's not a Christian. A Christian lives out Christianity in the context of community. And the word of God brings light and life in the context of relationship and community. We had that picture last week of, of this pyramid of community. People in our church building up together community. Man, we need that. As we teach people to obey we need to give them the right motivation. Obedience is not meant to be out of fear. I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of the elders, so I'm going to obey. It's not meant to be trying to earn God's favor. God gives grace. It means he gives us favor that we don't deserve. Obedience is not to show others how good we are. Can you see how obedient I am? That's ugly in the eyes of God. That kind of religious putting yourself up there, self-righteousness, ugly stuff in the eyes of God. So what is the motivation for obedience? Well, Jesus tells his disciples that they should obey because of love. And he said this several times in John chapter 14. He was preparing them for his departure. He's about to return to heaven. And he's been preparing them, saying different things. And, 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 and he's telling these guys that, guys, um, the reason for obeying my commands is actually love. In John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. If there was no love for Jesus, then once Jesus left, they would be following Jesus possibly with the wrong motives. He's gone now, so I never really loved him. But if, if I loved him, even when he's not there, I will still want to obey. I'll still want to please him because, man, I love him. And, and Jesus was trying to impress on their hearts. Obedience is because of love. It's not because of a big stick. Do this. No, it's, it's love. When we are teaching obedience, let's be sure to teach something that we are practicing ourselves. These disciples spent three years learning obedience from Jesus. They weren't perfect, but they had certainly made some progress. And Jesus was asking them to teach obedience because they had learned obedience. So if we are asking people to obey, hopefully we have taken some steps in that direction ourselves in this area of obedience. Making disciples is not only about going to people outside the church. There's definitely a go. It's also about staying with people in the church. 
drawing alongside. We need to help those in the church to grow in obedience to Jesus Christ. Jesus formed an authentic community. And then for three years, he, he poured into that community. He gave himself, poured into that community, built that community, shaped that community, prayed for that community, corrected when necessary, challenged, encouraged, inspired, taught, gave himself for that community. And then through that, he's preparing them. He's making them into something. He's forming them into disciples who will then go and make disciples. But friends, we, we must be very clear that there is this element of staying with as well as going. It's both. We have a community, this church. This is where we should be pouring into each other and preparing each other to be disciples who make disciples. So who in this community are you going to help to become a more committed follower of Jesus Christ? For some of us, we, we can already think, well, I'm already doing that with him, with her, with him, with her. Uh, you know, I'm already doing it. Praise God, keep doing it. Keep going. For some of us, maybe we're thinking, wow, actually, I, I'm not really involved with anyone in this church helping them to become more committed as a follower of Christ. Well, it's time to start. It's time to obey. As, as an elder, I... I have a heart to help everyone in the church become a more committed follower of Jesus. And it kind of starts at home. And I'm thinking of the kids as well. I'm thinking of the people in this room. And I'm like, yeah, man, I want everyone in this church to become a more committed follower of Christ. But I, I just have to be honest that I have a heart, if I could call it that, there's something God has put in me more for men. Like, I feel God's just saying, you, you need to help other men become more committed followers of Jesus. And I've got a couple of men in my life that our relationship goes beyond this on a Sunday. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trusting God to somehow be helping them to, to be growing. There's only so much, only so many men that I can actually get into that kind of closer relationship with. And I know probably there's other men in the church doing similar things. I do believe, however, there's a need for more. There's a need for more men in this church to draw alongside other men. And help other men grow in their relationship with Christ. And it's not a program. It's like in the middle of your life as it's going. And you're thinking, man, I'm so busy already. Another thing. Yeah, living as disciples of Christ, is, there's a cost to it. Jesus says we need to count that cost. So I want to just encourage us as men, please do be praying about that. Please be thinking about that. How can we as men grow in this area? There's stuff happening with women as well. Usually the women are doing more than the men in, 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 in our church. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there's more stuff happening in that world. I know, for example, my wife, she, uh, she meets with, with some women. Even yesterday, we had a group of younger women come to our house to spend time with Trudy. And she's, she's discipling them. She's pouring into them. Some of them are in this room. Praise God. 
I know some of you women, others are probably doing similar things as well. I just want to encourage that. The Bible actually says that older women should teach younger women. How do we grow together in a culture of discipleship? For us as a church, there are a number of areas that we have identified from the Bible as being essential in our obedience to Jesus Christ. These are things that we say every person that's part of our church, we want to be growing in this, challenging each other in this. If you have gone through a members class with us, you would have heard these things said. So I'm just going to briefly make reference to them. Firstly, is this idea of being together by meeting. Actually, meeting like this on a Sunday or or a life group, or a prayer meeting. The Bible says we should meet together. The writer of Hebrews said that we should meet together and not get into the habit of giving that up. They're, they're those who can get into the habit of, I'm, I'm not meeting. I'm not going to be there. The Bible says we should, we should meet together, being together. The church is a community. It's a people that meet, that are together. It's, it's, the, it's the living stones that God has built together and He lives there by His Spirit. So there's this togetherness. Secondly, baptism. I'm not going to say anything more about baptism. I've already spoken about that. Serving. We want every person at God's tribe to serve. Jesus Christ in John 13, he kind of rolls up his sleeves and he washes the feet of his disciples. And then he says, as I've done this for you, do it for others. Do it for each other. He's basically saying, I've taught you to serve, now serve one another. When his disciples were arguing about greatness, Jesus doesn't say greatness is bad, but he, he helps them to understand greatness. And he says that greatness is actually to serve. If, if this is your church and you are not serving in some area, you are not being obedient. And we need you to serve. We've, we've had people leaving the church in different areas. And, 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 and some of us, you know, we, we come on Sunday and, we, and, and we, we are here and then we leave and we hope we can come back next week. We, we need you to serve. If, if this is your church, we need you to serve. Kids, youth. The hospitality team, the audiovisual team. Arthur over there, he's, a, he's an elder in training. Him and his wife, Alice, they've, they've kind of stepped in to really help with this audiovisual stuff. Because, well, over the years, we've lost a few guys who are really good at this stuff. Nathaniel, jack of all trades kind of guy, he's gone now. We, we need you to serve. But beyond needing you to serve, your serving is obedience to Jesus Christ. So, if you would like to serve, if you're not serving, praise God for the many of you who already are serving. And that's many of us. But if you are not serving, we have a card here which will allow you to sign up for an area of service. So would you like to raise your hand? If you're not serving and you would like to serve, anybody, fill that card right now. The welcome team, thank you for those hands. Well done, guys. Pick an area that you think you can get involved in in the life of our church. Please keep your hand up until you get that card. 
hand it back to one of the welcome team members at the end. Together through sharing our faith, Jesus wants us to all be witnesses, telling others about what we believe, telling others the good news, John 3.16, sharing our faith. And that's why we're doing evangelism training next Saturday. Hope many of us will be there. Sharing our faith is a big part of what it means to follow Christ. And then finally, together through financial giving, giving money. What we say to people as they consider joining the church, we say we want people to give generously. We want people to give sacrificially. We don't believe that you have to tithe, but we do believe that if in the Old Testament, because the, the, the tithe is, you know, it's, it's from the law, it's from the Old Testament, when we're not under the law any longer, but we do say that if, if under the Old Covenant they were giving 10%, those of us who are now under the New Covenant having experienced the grace of God more fully in Jesus Christ, knowing that God has given everything in His Son, shouldn't we be giving even more than they did under the Old Covenant? Angie brought that word about transparency, and I just want to be transparent with you that over the course of last year, I was struggling in this area of giving. I was getting tight with money. I was like, man, I, I, I'm not sure I can keep being faithful as I've been in the years before. And, and, and I've had conversations with my wife and I've had to confess to her and say, hey, babe, you know what? I've not been faithful in giving the way we had agreed to give. And, and one of the things that I'm trusting God for in 2020 is that we can go back to just being more generous, being more faithful, living more sacrificially in this area of money. And I just want to encourage us all, if this is your church, thank you for being generous. Let's continue to be generous. Let's grow in being generous. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is speaking to the pastors, the elders from the church of Ephesus, and he tells them about how he's worked with his own hands to provide for his needs and the needs of, of, of those with him. And, and then he says, because the Lord has said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus ends the Great Commission with a very reassuring statement. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Although Jesus was soon going to return to heaven, he assures his disciples that he is with them always. He will not leave them. He is Emmanuel, God with us. As we make disciples, we will face ups and downs. The devil is against us. But Jesus did say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is with us. And what he says here is of great comfort. It's of great strength that he will be with us always until we finish the work that he has before us. May that encourage us. And as we close, I hope all of us will take this commission from Jesus seriously. I hope each of us will take some steps towards being a more committed disciple of Jesus. I hope each of us will play more of a role in making disciples. Our church, our city, our nation, and the world 
can be impacted by our obedience. And I hope and pray that we will not be the same. That they will be changing your life today and in my life. That this will be a community that is making disciples for the glory of God. And we're going to respond with the song. And as the band comes up, I'm just going to pray for us, invite us to stand. Lord Jesus, please help us to obey. Lord, I pray that today's, it's, it's not just going to be, oh yeah, you know, I, I heard some things. I pray that there would be a change in our lives today. That every person here will experience transformation through the power of your word as your Holy Spirit works in us. That we would be a church, a community that is making disciples. That your kingdom would be coming through us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.